welcome to this week's edition of Inter-University Debate. I'm your moderator. My name is Fancy Jendalake. I'm an advocate and a tax consultant. Inter-University Debate is brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV. It airs on Civic Space TV on YouTube every Thursday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you never miss to watch our students discuss important issues that affect this country. Now, this week, we are hosting students from different universities, a powerful panel. We have two gentlemen and one lady. You're welcome to the talk show. Thank you very Thanks. much. So, this week, we are discussing how accountable is the government under the current leadership. Now, the current leadership, that is the leadership under His Excellency Yowere Kaguta Museveni, came into power in 1986. As we know from our history, we have never had a peaceful transition of power. But when the government came in place in 1986, the government has ruled since then. In 2023, today, we sit and look at the issue of accountability under this current regime. Now, there has been several issues that have come up. Several individuals think that the government under the current regime is actually accountable based on several arguments that they bring forward, legal provisions that have been brought in place, um, anti-corruption works that have been done, courts that have been set up, and several other things in there. While also, on the other hand, several people have come up, especially civil society organizations, opposition leaders, international community, and other citizens have also, on the other hand, come up and say the current government is not accountable based on several issues that they propose. Others come up with issues of suppression of opposition, uh, suppression of the media, civil society organization, corruption, scandals, embezzlement. We are yet to look into the scandal of the iron sheets and what a time to discuss the issue of accountability. Let me introduce the panelists for today and we kick start that discussion with the panelists. I'll start with the gentleman that is seated right next to me. Just for the record, the two are familiar with inter-university debate. We only have one new face to the, to, to the debate and Joan, you very much welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me give a general discussion, uh, I mean, introduction. I will start with Mr. Gironde Scottmark. Scottmark is a student at Kampala University, Gaba branch. You're welcome back to the inter-university debate. Thank you very much. We are happy to have you just that in today's setup, you'll be discussing with students from other universities. So how does it feel? Mm, feels to be more of an excitement okay. introduction. Okay, thank you. We are happy to have you for that show. The only lady on the panel, just after celebrating Women's Day, we, we, we have a lady on the panel. We are hoping that next week we have more than one lady on the panel. Yeah. So it's our obligation to make sure that we have more ladies on the panel. So Miss. Tejike Joan from Clark International University. You're welcome to the Inter-University Debate. Thank you very much. Okay, our third panelist is Mr. Mwanje Derek. Derek is a Vice President Patriotism Club at St. Lawrence University. Derek, you're welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's kick start the discussion, Mark, with the issue of accountability. This is something that so many people are so passionate about because it's something that is important for a country to grow. So looking at accountability, this topic talks about how accountable is the government under the current leadership. My first question to you is, what is the measure of accountability? What do you measure accountability against? What is the yardstick when you're measuring accountability of the current government? Well, thank you very much. My name is Scott Mark, once again, and I'm pleased to be on this show. So, you know, the word accountability runs from to every sector, and you know, it's something in simple sense. I would want to say that um, literally the word accountability means that you need to assert what you did for 
And then when we try to look at this regime, and we say, okay, we try to compare it to the other, just that it has, I would say it has a disadvantage. It has lasted in power for more than 30 years, meaning that to a larger extent, its accountability st stable is not so good. From the events and occasions that we have been able to see and understand as citizens, the government has not been able to be accountable to the citizens. For, from the money it is spending, from the loans, grants, and donations it receives from other countries. If you try to put it down to paper, most of the officials would be arrested, and which is not clearly being put out for the public to understand, because every time we try to assert, we are either uh, diverted by something else, or I don't know how I could try to phrase it, something, something tries to come up. So most of the times, the accountability part has never been put to the table. We don't know people who are responsible for the accountability of this country, what are they really up to? Because the government, I would say it has tried to put up different offices, the anti-corruption office, the IGG, but literally you find that even within these very offices, there's corruption. So I don't know how a person who is supposed to help us do accountability will start up if within his own premise there is trouble. So trying to look, if I try to look at the other past governments, is that some were not in power as much as this one. They could have tried maybe to a larger or a smaller extent and failed somewhere. But this one has lasted into power for a long time. At least it should have had a larger impact onto the society of this country. Okay, thank you so much, Derek. For that, let me move to Joan. Yeah. So, Joan, when you're looking at accountability of the current leadership, which we know we were all born <coughs> under, <laughs> so <laughs> we were all born when the current government had taken some time already in yeah. power. Um, so, what what is the measure in your own context for accountability? What do you look at when you're looking at accountability for the current leadership? Well. Um, Thank you. So basically, when I look at the accountability for the current leadership, I would say to some extent there has been accountability, to some extent. But I would say that the major problem arising for us um, as Ugandans under this leadership would be the corruption. Now, we all remember uh, of recent when His Excellency was talking about curbing corruption within the country. And, but basically, you cannot really curb something that is within the, the system already. So I feel like the government does want to be accountable, but the issues are arising with the people that actually do handle the accountability books. Um, to me, accountability would be a willingness of someone to take up their decisions like, let me say I do something and I will tell you about it. I am accountable for it. But within our government and within this leadership, I feel like we do things, the officials do do things, like they carry out different requisitions and transactions, and they do not let we, as Ugandans, the general public, know about it. And that is failing, failing us as Ugandans when it comes to accountability in this nation. Okay, so Joan, at a later time, I'll come back to you on the issue you raised. There's that sentence of you feel like the government wants to be accountable, but the people who handle the accountability. <laughs> so <laughs> would like you like to say, to, to see the difference in there between the two. You know, there is that joke of, um, I have Panasonic, but not Panasonic. So we, <laughs> so we will get back on that issue. So. Let me move to Derek. Derek, what when you're looking at accountability, the same thing I asked Mark and Joan, what is your yardstick, your measure of accountability under the current regime? What, what do you look at when you're looking at the accountability context? Yeah, thank you so much, our moderator. Uh, when it comes to accountability, how accountable is the current government 
under the our accountable is their government under the current leadership. When it comes to accountability, me I will look at it in a different perspective. Though even the, my colleagues, which they looked a bit corruption, it is the it is also the one of the things that we need to look at when you're looking at accountability. But for me, I'll be a bit different, saying that our government is totally not accountable because when we come to the issue of, you see, our government has promised a lot of things but never fulfilled. But the reason is maybe the middleman be between us, the citizens, and the president or the government, maybe they're the problem. Therefore, they were seeing accountability not coming up very well just due to the unfulfilled promises. Yes, I will look at accountability when it comes to luxurious expenditures that the government do make because the government spend a lot of money on nonsense things, things that don't matter, things that don't, uh, don't benefit the way the citizens. So to me, I'm seeing the government is not accountable at all. Okay. Thank you so much for your context under which you would measure the government's accountability. So let's approach this topic very, very directly. And I'll start with you, Derek. H how accountable is this government, this leadership? No, I'll, I'll start with Mark. How accountable is, 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 is this government? If you could expound on that. How accountable is this government? Well, that is a broad question, and we could try to pick out some of the perspectives, as he has said. One is corruption. Second is the spending. Uh, third, uh, I could say the premises made to the people. So I want to start with corruption. How accountable is our government? If I try to look at the recent governments that have been in power, I would say, I would give this government at least a hands up. Because in the recent governments that we have been able to witness, let me say the government of Idi Amin Dada, the government of Milton Obote, whereby he was a president twice. You may look at um, the government of Vinaisa, Yusuf Lule, then also, yeah, and also maybe the other one of Tito Kelo. At least this government is trying its best to crab corruption, even though it's not at an appropriate stage. It has tried in many ways. One, it has created different offices. You could see the IGG, that is one. The anti-corruption unit, that is number two. Mm -hmm. the, also one of the offices in the, well, sorry, in the state house. And if we try to compare all these, it is a way. It is a solution. It's like a path they are trying to at least try and solve the corruption issue we are facing into this country. Then I will go to number two. That is uh, the spending. I would say this government is worse off than the previous ones when we come into spending. For example, let me bring out a point whereby, um, if, let me just use the recent ones, I think where people can understand more. Like, for example, the iron sheets saga that we have been witnessing, as you know that these iron sheets have been brought for people in relief. But in the end, the, the iron sheets are being mismanaged, being taken by ministers. And if you look at who is taking, this is not a poor person. This is someone who can afford such things, but someone takes them, puts them on uh, their houses, putting them on their animal sheds. And then if, when they are being asked, why did you do that? He's saying, is it an empowerment? I don't know. Is it a short-term impact or a long-term impact? Something like that. Then you try to look at also the NSSF saga, whereby in one entire office, it's a family. I don't know. Should we call it a family reunion, working together? So how does one order the other one? Uh, meaning now services are not being given out to people. Then also I come to number three, that is the promises that are being made. At least, you know, in the previous governments, they, do not, they, didn't know, they didn't put up much promises. We are going to do this, we are going to do this, we are going to have this, we are going to have this. But um, in this, re uh, this recent regime, you look at, um, if I can recall properly, uh, one of the ministers said some years back that by 2020, each Ugandan will be 
gaining technically the wage would be 1 million but i think when we wake up to reality <laughs> no one is getting 1 million people are getting even less and less money so the promises the government makes i don't know on maybe the uh, previous governments didn't put up a lot of these promises but i don't know this one whereby we have these leaders who just want to promise you something in order to get into the seats and after they get into the seats they just want to enjoy the privileges that are coming on and also you could come at a part whereby if we try to look at covid whereby this country was being affected by covid-19 at least the expenditure should have been lowered when we look for example let me say the procurement of cars for ministers and mp's which is worth 200 million they should have at least tried to advise and they say this time around we are cutting up they must let me say at least 100 million is going to be cut off in each car meaning that if they cut off 100 million from each of the mp's and ministers this money could at least be used to help the individuals give them food uh, let me say medication and the rest of the thing. At least these resources are now being taken over by the government. For example, there was a time period, I think that was around 2014 to 2015, when Lake Victoria was now being guarded by the army. Yet they were saying that they were trying to overcome the issue of underfishing and others, but now the local people who were surviving on the lake were no longer gaining. They would tell them that you cannot take a specific species of a fish out and if you have it you are supposed to sell it to us at this amount of money meaning now they are decided to determine the living standard of these individuals and which is not beneficial to the society so when you try to look at all these three corruption uh, promises and also the state capturing the resources that are supposed that are meant to help the people it shows that this state is not trying to be accountable. And if they had, they had tried, okay, they had tried to put up measures and they were like, oh no, we are trying to protect and everything. But really, it never came out to the public to understand what is really happening. Mm -hmm. So I would say this state, it has failed on a larger part to be accountable to the citizens. It is governing. Unless it tries out, but it seems its time has come up. Okay. Thank you so much, Scott Mark. Let me move to Joan. So, Joan, Joan, earlier on you said something concerning the government trying to um, have an interest. Mm -hmm. if, if you, you can just correct me if I'm quoting you wrong mm -hmm. to account, but mm -hmm. the issue are the people who are supposed to provide the accountability. Mm -hmm. Could you expound more on that? Because especially what is the difference between the government and the people who are supposed to account? Mm -hmm. Um, basically, um, if I may correct myself, um, some part, let me say part of the government and the other part. For example, when His Excellency came out and talked about really wanting to curb corruption and everything and all these offices came up, yes? That means he had interest to curb the corruption to handle it it shows he does not want the officials to be corrupt so basically for him and let me say part of his team they have interest to curb the corruption but the problem comes in with the other part let me not mention names but the other part of the officials that is what i meant that sometimes the root cause is actually within but Part of what is within wants to curb the corruption. Though let me say the other part basically is too used to it. So maybe they feel like they cannot survive without it because maybe it is how or their means of making a living. Of the citizens. <laughs> of the citizens at the expense of we, the citizens of the nation. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Let me move to Derek. Derek, I know earlier on in your submission, you said the government is not accountable. Yes. Yeah. So if you could expound on that. Yeah, the government is not accountable due to the fact that it has failed to, to use the funds that we, the citizens of Uganda, we provide to it through the taxes it collects from Earth. It collects from Earth. First of all, the government told that is led by the president of Uganda, President YK Seven, is associated or is full of officials that are really misusing our funds. You find 
you find out, you find some ministries, you find some ministries of the government having ghost workers. Ghost workers whereby the minister is a head, but he brings his young son, his <laughs> young grandson, the other to come to be named as employees, but they are getting salaries, but they are almost ghost workers. And the end of the day, we find ourselves being costed, being forced to go for loans, which would have not gone for them. Therefore, to me, that's, that's the first perspective where the government is not what? Accountable. Then the other thing is that uh, the government is not accountable due to the fact that it has failed to provide what it promised for the citizens or the what? Of the country. For example, service delivery is totally poor. It's, it is totally poor due to the corrupt officials or due to the corrupt middlemen that are between the government and us with the citizens that are responsible to provide what? The services to us. For example, we have a lot of roads within the within our country. For example, our capital here, Kampala, the roads are full of potholes. Recently, I had, I saw KCC officials led by Dorothy Saka, the executive director, and uh, with uh, being tasked or being interrogated with uh, the Kosase, the Kosase committee within the parliament that is led by Joel Senyuni, that is the MP, is it Nakawa? They, they were really, they were really, not giving out the proper accountability for that money because they were like you're giving us different figures the the executive director is having different figures the accounting officers have different figures and the system is it is having what different figures you see all that brings us a picture that our government is really misusing our funds and it is misusing our funds in advantage of our in interest of the few people that are really that are really going that are really don't going to take that money back to the what to be in circulation then the other thing is the government is not accountable due to the fact that it is bringing in too 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 much organization or should i call them units to fight corruption but within those units we have corrupt officials therefore i don't know whether we can really fight corruption or, or we can really be accountable when you have corrupt officials within the offices that you were really trusted to fight what? Corruption. For example, for example, during the, the scandal during the COVID-19, when they were providing food to us, eh? several officials within the office of the prime minister were arrested due to coming up, hiking the prices of what? Or the food, whereby the suppliers that had that proposed to supply food to the government at a low prices, they were rejected by the what the accounting officers within the office of the prime minister, and they accepted those with what prices that are high, and it costed the government alone. Actually, it costed the government at around uh, uh, five five thousand twenty eight thousand US dollars. That is a loss, okay, just because of the prices we are hiked. Therefore, that brings us to the picture that our government is really full of officials, but that that are really collecting funds or that are really um, going there to bring our things but at the end they take them back to their stomachs and at the end we find ourselves suffering living poor standards of having poor standards of living all that okay thank you so much uh derek let me come back to spot mark I know earlier we widened the discussion on accountability, not to just restrict it to corruption, but to give it a wider context, including the promises that the government made um, in terms of what it intends to offer the citizens. But let's, let's single out one issue. We look at it in depth, and that is the issue of corruption. Now, to what extent has the government tried to what extent has the government tried to fight that vice? Well, the government, I can say, let me give it credit, it has, it has tried. Of course, everything comes from trying, but it has failed. For example, we can bring up the most recent one, the CEO of Uganda Airlines, whereby she had been taken to the Kokasa Parliament. Uh, the Kosase. Sorry, Kosase. yeah, that one, um, whereby she was being judged. I thought during time of judgment, you were supposed to be on suspension. That means you're not supposed to be doing anything. You're supposed to be seated down. But to amusement, she was up and running. 
and then the report was pushed under the mat. So I'm just asking myself, do they just try to do these procedures just to give us hope and then at the end of the time tarnish it? Because really most of the times we have been trying to look at uh, different corruption scandals in the Republic of Uganda. For example, I can take you back to 2007 during the Chogam, whereby Uganda hosted Chogam. The money that was allocated was really a lot, almost 500 billion. But then I will try to look at now a specific amount was embezzled. Now that was with uh, the Prime Minister, by then the Vice President, that is Gilbert Bukenya, Amama and Babas, and some other individuals. This money was taken up because, because the initial budget was around 270 uh, billion for the Chogam. But then somehow, somewhere, the budget was hiked and then it rose up to, 100, to 500, 500 billion. But in the accountability books, they tried to put up accountability and the money wasn't matching. But the, the, the rest of the money that they tried to allocate was being seen that it had moved, it had been taken up by those specific individuals. But then nothing was being done. The vice president kept on being the vice president, the prime minister kept on being the prime minister, and others, other officials kept on. Even though it was tabled, put on to court, what, nothing happened. Then also you could look at um, the dam scandal also, whereby it was under Jean Mohwezi. The almost it was almost around 700 billion that was allocated, but to the eastern region that is the semi arid area, so that people could have water to for farming, for drinking, and the rest. But in the end, nothing happened, no dams were constructed. Mm -hmm. And when it was tabled under parliament, the man couldn't explain, not even wear a single penny, but was kept into power. So I really ask myself when someone has been uprooted that he's facing corruption. Why isn't this person arrested? Why isn't this person charged? Why isn't this person's asset freezed? Why does this, because now recently we have seen um, some, a minister who comes up and uh, tries to bring up an issue of corruption. The next thing we do understand, they are going to make you resign. The parliament is going to censor you and the next, next thing they want you is to resign if someone has brought up, but then you try to look at the person is trying to bring up an important issue because that is generic. But as we understand that most of our ministers and MPs, corruption is there. As you know, so for Sam Kutesa, uh, he does own the airport, if I'm right. So also he had another scandal that was with foreign aid that had came in. The money was shared in between. Because the person who shared him the money, the international agent, was arrested. But here, nothing happened. So I don't understand why we have so much information, so much procedures for corruption. Yet in actual sense, in reality, we are not putting it at hand. Yet these people continue roaming freely. And if they are arrested, someone is arrested for weeks, or just, okay, two months or three, just to give us the ben to, re to remove the benefit of doubt, and we say, okay, this person has been arrested. But if you try to keep up a follow-up after two to three months, that person is set free. And to not uh, rouse any suspicion among the citizens, the person moves outside the country for some sort of either two years or three years, then comes back. Then everything is back to normal. Yet remember, this person has embezzled. If it's donation, it's us, the taxpayers, who are going to face the consequences at the end of the day because it's us who are supposed to repay the money, or if it's not us, it will be our kids or grandkids. Yet the other person is living in wealth. So this government has failed, even though it has tried to put up, it has failed. As an old saying says, this government has learned nothing and has forgot nothing to implement. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, uh, Scott Mark, for that. Let me move to John. So, John, let us pick right from Scott Mark's discussion. Okay. The issue of the strength mm -hmm. of the institutions that have been set up to fight corruption. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm asking this because stemming from his discussion and from what we have seen in the media, because we know we have we have Kosase in yes. place, mm -hmm. we have PAC mm -hmm. in place, we have the State House Anti-Corruption Unit, yeah. we have the Anti-Corruption Court in place. 
and it has the Anti-Corruption Act that guides it. We have the IGG in place. We have several other bodies. That is just the, the bigger bodies that have been set up. Now, I would like us to dissect their strength in terms of fighting corruption because we have seen several things come up. Like recently, I was reading through Joel Senyonyi's uh, social media page and he was complaining on the issue of the co issue of the Kosase report. When the when when the, the Speaker of Parliament has ordered for an audit into Kosase right mm -hmm. after the 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 the, 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 the questioning the issue of the the, the airport the civil aviation authority mm -hmm. then so so it makes me want to ask this question what is your perspective mm -hmm. on the strength of the institutions that are supposed to fight corruption mm -hmm. well thank you Madreta. so my perspective on the strength i would say the strength is very low yes we do have the institutions set up the formalities are there that is the fact they are there <coughs> But the problem comes in with the people in the positions of those formalities. Because you cannot tell me, I, let me say, I am part of the IGG. I am leading it. I'm basically telling you I want to curb the corruption, yet I myself am being corrupt. Basically, that means the whole organization is corrupt to some extent. Because if I can be bribed so easily, yet I am leading an organization that is supposed to fight the corruption in the nation to help the citizens develop, then the strength of the organization is low. Yes, we do have the formalities, we see the proceedings, we see the reports. I'm not sure if they are true or the figures are forged, but we do see the reports sometimes, sometimes we do not. So basically, I wouldn't understand why institutions are set up if they lack purpose and if they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Let me push this question to Derek. Scott, Mark, do you have something to add on that? No, she's, she's right. Okay. Let me push this question to Derek as well. The strength of the institutions <coughs> that have been set up to fight corruption. What is your perspective? As earlier, as earlier you mentioned that... Uh, the people they put to fight corruption are bribed easily. That is the problem we have in Uganda. I don't know whether the salaries they give them, they are very little to, you know, to make them sustain their standards of living. I don't know whether I would want to do, but the strength is, to, let me give a standpoint. To a lesser extent, the strength is there. But to a greater extent, they are doing nothing. Why am, why am I saying so? For example, as my colleague has earlier told us that these people are caught, or you, let us say the anti-corruption unit that is in set out that is, is led by Col Edith Nakalema, recently, Rick, is in previous in the last year, there are certain officials that he came up and called, but within a few months, the officials were let out. They were set free, okay? Therefore, we see the, those organizations that are put in place but are just wasting our taxpayers' money, okay? Because maybe because what I'm sure of, we fund them to do their work because they cannot they cannot operate without funds. But at the end of the day, we end up making losses as with the people of Uganda, as with the taxpayers, we make losses just because these people have not done what they are supposed to be doing. I don't know whether they fear those figures to go. I mean, those people to. I don't know whether they're too big to be caught, to be put in jail, but within, but my research is within two weeks, within one month, the people, the what? The people that are caught giving corruption, uh, give, being corrupt over giving the bribe, they are let out of the jail within no time, okay? Therefore, my perspective is the anti-corruption unit, the anti-corruption court, the judges, I don't know, the, we need to just terminate the old government so that we may get, we may release corruption. That is my stand. Okay, Derek, <laughs> let, me, let me bring Mark into that discussion as well. So we are talking about the strength of these institutions, Mark. What do you think are the challenges with these institutions that have been set up to fight corruption? 
Okay, um, thank you. The number one challenge, I would say, it's a family reunion. <laughs> Most of these institutions, technically, you go into an institution, then you, ha you understand that this is an uncle, this is an auntie, a niece, a nephew, mm -hmm. a cousin, a brother. So you cannot tell me, literally, I cannot be the uncle, and then the other is the niece, and is ordering me around, can capture this country. So literally, I would take a break, because I know ah, this is just like a family business. So I don't care, is it going to prosper or not? My job is to just come here, sit, pretend I'm doing office work, get money. If I can get a bribe of 50M, why not? I go out on a vacation, I take my kids somewhere. So if you do not stop family reunions in these big offices, we are going to still have a big problem. You know, they always say, put principles before passion. If our government could do that, we would be very far. We would have the character to run offices. Employ people according to specific standards. Not because you know someone. Okay, yes, if you know someone, but make sure that that person has the standards required to operate in an office. Don't put someone there and just say, okay, you know, you, you, you're my relative, you're my friend. I know you, don't, you, don't, you, you didn't study for this, but you know what, just come and sit here. Just do some typing, just do some office work, and that is it. So if the real case comes in, we are facing corruption, and then this person needs to do your work, he will go to the field, he knows nothing, and guess what, if the corrupt person passes the other side and gives him an envelope, tells him, do you know what, do for me this, just pass this. Of course, literally, this person, the fact that he doesn't know the work he's doing, he's going to accept the bribe, and nothing's going to happen. So one of the biggest challenges we are facing that we are having unqualified personnel in these offices. They do not know what to do. Because it way you cannot drive a car when you don't know how to drive a car. The next thing we have, it's an accident. So until we start looking through, of course, I know government had one time tried to do that, but I don't know what happened. It tried to phase out, cleanse most of its department, making sure that the right personnel are sitting there. But most of the times, as you know, if, if it's trying, you receive threats, as in, who are you? Why are you trying to do this? So that, that is one of the biggest challenges. If it can be stopped, then that is appropriate. Then the other thing, these officials, sometimes they are threatened to accept bribes. Someone will tell you, you have to do this in order to survive here. For example, there can be new employees into the office. You know, there's what we call intimidation of the, they so call it power from above, order from above. I don't know which above it is, but they already say that. You know, most of the times now, you have young employees, okay, who are passionate about work and who want to do the right thing. But there will be that intimidation. You know, someone will be like, you know what, if in order for you to survive, you have to do what the other person tells you. So now this person is going to do whatever they are being told, either right or wrong. And that's not the implication. The implication is now the person down here who is paying his taxes, is not receiving the services that are supposed to come up. So one, put in the right people in the right offices. Number two, let us, let us try to reduce the intimidation. Then let us try to look at number three. Let us not try to overexpand. you know, something being so elastic. If you have created a unit to fight corruption, let it be one strong unit. But every time you create a unit, then you start creating divisions. Say, okay, now, now, you guys, you're also independent. You ought to, you know, sometimes, okay, we say decentralization of power is good, but it has also disadvantages. Okay, Mark, let's take a, let's, let me catch you there. We'll come back with you. Let's take a short break and still come back with the students from these different universities discussing the accountability of the current government. Thank you. See you after the break. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten, and a right for protection of minors, among others. 
The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back from that short break. We are still discussing on this talk show of inter-university debate, the accountability question when it comes to the current government in leadership. I am with Scott, Mark, Joanne, and Derek. So before we took that short break, we were with you, Scott, Mark, and you were still explaining. Yeah, uh, we were still giving some of the reasons, like... Yeah, the challenges. The challenges that, the that are, these institutions face. are facing. Yes. So I had given one. We are looking at... Uh, I don't want to call it tribalism, but we should always put in people who are more qualified, not just because of friends and everything, because... That will make sure that principles are being followed. Number two, we should try to reduce intimidation. You know, if you have people who are qualified, that means intimidation is going to be low. Then we try to look at um, the other third part, whereby I say, let us try to create one central power. Let us not try to create uh, too many units. Of course, now they are all fighting the same thing, because now you are going to have uh, conflict in interests each unit trying to show that it's working more than the other, doing this and this, and some will technically not try to work it out. Like, uh, they won't be able to do anything. They will be overshadowed. So, if we can create one strong unit and say, okay, now we want the IGG to be the one to handle all corruption cases. If someone is found guilty, then this happens. If the person isn't found guilty, they do this. But if you have five you could give an instance, you have now five units working. For example, one unit has been able to capture a minister and it has arrested the person. Before it's taking in, this other unit says, you know what, we are also charging this person, first give him to us. Now you are going to have a war emerging within this institute, meaning now these people are not going to be able to function. Yeah, I'm so, asking. yes? I'm asking you. I have a question for you. Yes. Don't yes. you think that uh, His Excellency, the President, is trying to create a blessing in this case, like uh, in two, creating more units, is trying to give his citizens some good employment opportunities? No, I cannot think like that. Do you know why? Number one, mm. I am I am paying taxes. So literally, they are going to make me pay more. I have five units to make sure that I sponsor. Mm. Now, so so, so if, I, if I get you right, uh, Mark, you're trying to say we shouldn't have so many units exactly. being created. We should, for example, if we are having IGG, we should have IGG fighting corruption, corruption. in the country. Because this will be easy. It will be easy for her to implement rules and regulations. Even her funding will be so very easy. Now you have five. We have, the government is funding five. Meaning now you're leaving other sectors that are important. You have the health sector. You have the education sector. So... We can't call it a blessing, and this it's not even disguise. In in short, it is theft under the cloth. But maybe the president thought of uh, thought of thought of that the duty is so big, therefore he decided to break it to into two units so that he may see the minister of education is having him to control it, the minister of health because that is a very big big tax to leave to the IGG alone. Okay, let me let me first shift this to, to, to Derek since he is throwing all the questions. <laughs> so Derek, what do you think? Mark's perspective is that let us have one body given the mandate to mm. fight corruption. Mm. So imagine a situation where we have IGG, we empower IGG, we give it all the manpower mm. to handle corruption scandals, corruption issues. Do you think we are going to need the State House Anti-Corruption Unit? Yes, my idea is, or my point is, yes, the issue of leaving the work to the IGG is really correct, and I'll support it. But what I, what I, what I don't really support, what I really want to the government to put in place, eh? not to put other units, like you put the anti-corruption one, you put the anti-corruption court, no. Just build the IGG's body, the manpower, like let every, let every district 
has a representative that reports to the IGIG's what? Office, everything, because that is the manpower that IGIG needs. Not to, not every day to have what? A union that fights corruption, okay? Yeah, but uh, the issue of creating more units, for me, I can see, for me, I can see some advantages of why the government is putting such, what? So many units, as I, as I asked my colleague, okay? Maybe they're trying to create more employment opportunities just because the citizens in Uganda, they are so much literate, but having no jobs. Maybe the president is trying to solve the unemployment pro problem. Then the other thing is, uh, uh, then the other thing is that uh, the issue of creating so so much much units it may bring some disorganization when it comes to investigations. Okay, you know they may hand a minister that is that you took the money that is supposed to take or that is supposed to buy goods because I'm here at a good scandal. Eh? There is this ghost scan, they bought ghosts that I really don't even get pregnant. I don't know why they don't cause it. <laughs> no? But uh, if you have different units, you'll handle you'll handle the certain minister until they seem that you then you find yourself, the other unit is saying no, it did not do that. Yet this one is being that. Therefore, the issue of creating one body, I support it, but I support the IGG to have a team whereby. It's having a team in every ministry to report what they are doing, what they are using the money for, so that the IGG's work is simplified. Okay. Thank you. Mark, were you done? or? No, I just wanted to... Okay, there was something you mentioned about employment, but we are trying to fight a problem. And literally, I don't want to see that you're creating employment. Okay, of course, you could say some people are earning something here and there, but our aim is to totally uproot a problem. That's why we are saying, let us have one unit. Mm -hmm. Everything will be very simple for us to handle. But if we try to create and enlarge, we are creating a room for, you know, some, some politicians, some mafias. You're going to create a room for mafias to inflict into government, mm -hmm. still implant their own personalities and continue with their ways of living. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, Thank you, Mark. I see Joan <laughs> is dying to add something. Yes. Um, actually, from my perspective and point of view, according to what Mark had said, I do support Derek to some extent because for me, the way I see it, it's both a blessing and a curse. I mean, decentralization has always been one of Uganda's bigger go-tos. And um, I feel like if all these bodies are in place and they cannot fight corruption, then how basically do both of you think that one body is able to do so? Yes. I feel like it shouldn't be about the bodies or who or who. It generally should be about you as a person, the people within, the personnel you put in, mm -hmm. the passion that they have to fight corruption. It is about the character of the people inside. Because yes, we will form an IGG body. And basically then what? it will not change anything. Because even though we have one strong body, it is being empowered, <coughs> but the people inside still have no reason to be there. It will not change anything. I feel like having more units eases the work. Mm. It eases the work generally, that is it, because Uganda is basically a very big country. It is not that big, but we are a lot of people. We are a lot of people. And basically, if you want to fight corruption, and let me say, fine, you have created the IGG, you're putting representatives at district levels. So, for example, I am now put at, let me say, I'm in Kapala district. I'm now the IGG representative. I am there, but I'm accepting bribes. Then what? It still comes back to me as a person, to my character, to we need people that have the passion, that have the love of the we country. are Ugandans, we are Ugandans, we need our country to develop. We see our citizens, they are paying tax. We need to give back to them. We need that kind of motion okay. within the employees. We have been joined by another member of the panel, and that is Mr. Twine Davis. You're welcome to the inter-university debate. He's a student at Kampala International University. Thank you, madam. Thank you for coming me, and I'm really glad to be here. Okay. So right away, we will start with you. Um, we won't even give you rest. So, what is your perspective on accountability of the current leadership uh, of this country under uh, the NRM regime, under uh, His Excellency Yoe Gagutam Seven? Uh, I think uh, if 
we to discuss the issue of uh, the accountability or how accountable is the government of Uganda or the government of President Yuri Kagutam Seven. We have to also concentrate on our history back that uh, by the time uh, this government came into power in uh, 1986, uh, it had uh, very many programs that it wanted to implement uh, to put, uh, to remember uh, when President Yuri Kagutam Seven came into power, he had uh, the 10 point uh, program. And among them was to make sure that uh, there is pros uh, prosperity, there is uh, development for everyone, uh, uh, there is politics, inclusive politics, that everyone can uh, come out and vote freely. But uh, and, uh, I, I always never want to first, I always never want to go negative first. I always want to at least first appreciate the fact that uh, the government has uh, done a few good things for the people. Uh, because if you historically look at the perspective of governance, uh, we've, uh, for instance, been seeing uh, the government implement some of uh, some of uh, some of the projects, and uh, and to mention still like a lady, uh, and uh, I think most of the ladies have appreciated the fact that at least their status has been uplifted, uh, yes. uh, which was really uh, not in existence right from the start, because if you try to compare the governments that they that were there before. President KM7 came into power. The status of women was not all that uh, inclusive or uh, uplifted. But when you look at the status today, we've, we have uh, very many women who have taken up very influential positions in government. We have even the speaker being a lady. We have uh, the prime minister. Or we have uh, the, the vice president. We have... Uh, the prime, uh, the prime minister, and all these people have been influential in the system of governance that has been under uh, President Eureka Gutam Seven. So I think that is to give it. Uh, I think I would applaud the government for that because that was not in existence first, and uh, also uh, uh, the sector of development. I think we've seen some of the districts develop. Uh, only that what is the challenge is that even when you look at the resource allocation, what is the challenge is that we've at least have, we have some of the districts that are mineral rich, uh, mineral based, but they are still backward. Because if you look at uh, Kasese, I for one come from Kasese, but the government has for decades been promising a lot for Kasese district. I shouldn't say that, I, I, I cannot say that it has totally done nothing for the district. But I think it has been uh, like uh, uh, something that they, they have not improved it to the extent because when you look at Kasese district, it has very many minerals, it has uh, very many tourist attractions. But and uh, the government has even for now been promising the district to reconstruct or uh, to renovate and get the railway line back. But for decades up to now, that has not been seen, and. Uh, that is a bit a challenge. So I, for one, uh, getting right to the question, I think uh, account, if you to look accountability, we should for we should put it on a measure, put it on a weighing scale, and look at what are some of the positive things, what are some of the uh, some of the things that have been brought up by the government and that which are really influential, and uh, but if you to still look at if you to compare because. Uh, if you to want to appreciate, uh, uh, if you want to appreciate your country, you should also look at the other country. Though you may not necessarily compare them, but at least these are some of the countries that uh, we need to borrow leaf. When you look at Kenya, Kenya has at least some. It is a bit. I should say it is totally far away from us, Ugandans. Uganda, though Uganda is uh, termed as the pearl of Africa, but you look at. Uh, you also have to remember that what would you really show on table to really uh, prove uh, what is evident to show that it is really the part of Africa. Though we can still be proud for that, but then if you compare your, if we to compare Uganda with Kenya, you, Kenya is at least far away in terms of politics, governance, democracy, uh, system of governance. 
Kenya is totally far away because I, for one, would look at a government, my government, to be that government that at least would entertain, especially the young, to engage in politics, uh, people to vote with their will, uh, people to come up uh, and uh, vote knowing, but we are having voters who are voting even on pressure. They are voting on pressure, voting with a gun zone, and uh, you, you find that the vote totally loses out its meaning. When you look at the arms of government, though they seem to be independent in the mayor statute, as the constitution may provide, that these are supposed to be independent. But when you look at in the practical part of it, they are totally not independent. Because if we have, uh, if we have the law, uh, if we can say, if we to say that, uh, for the law to be implemented, it should be taken by. It should be. We know the processes of how the law is implemented, yeah, the how it is has drafted. To to it. Exactly, president has to assent to it. But you look at uh, when you look at uh, even when these laws are drafted, what is the what is the challenge is that they are never implemented. So we have the laws that are in existence but not implemented. Yeah. So the law totally loses out its meaning. We still we even have corruption tendencies. Uh, Uganda has been also announced to be one of the countries that have stimulated the high rates of corruption in the rest of the world. And uh, this corruption is uh, a challenge in a way that it has been here ever since this government came into power and it has not been solved. Uh, it, it, it was also in the 10 point manifesto that you talked about. Exactly, uh, the bid to fight against corruption, but it has totally not been implemented. Because if you're having officials who are accountable for stealing money that is supposed to help people, uh, people out there are crying, people in Karamoja do not even have food. Uh, I, I, I should first, first of all seek for security. Uh, because I am talking, I'm talking about this on, a, on a, a painful point of view. Because I'm a Ugandan, and I've been seeing under Ugandan youth uh, who has been seeing this uh, existing in my country. And if I cannot be the voice, then it means we, we, shall, uh, we shall be seeing th these things come into existence, leave them, see them, and we do not have solutions for them. So I think the right solution could be first our voices, that we, the young youths, look at what is really the challenges and then become the voice of the voiceless. Because if we cannot come out and then uh, preach against these vices that are eating up our country, then I think we do not have uh, a foundation for the rest of our children. There are children that are coming in future. Yeah, so I, I think I've looked at the accountability of uh, how positive they have tried to implement of some of the policies, but they have, the government has also still failed on most fundamental aspects of life especially the bid to fight against corruption that has totally failed up to now. Of recent, we've been having even uh, stories of how uh, some of these officials took up uh, the iron sheets. And you even wonder, you, uh, you wonder how, which kind of government we're in if, because if some of these resources, some of these uh, items are supposed to be helping these people who are crying out there, then these people who already have the money, how accountable are they going to be for, the, uh, for, the, for, for these people who are suffering? These people already have the money, but they still think that this money is not enough for them. So I think if, uh, if we're to say, put it on a balanced point of view, or to put it on a weighing scale, I think the government uh, has on a, a very big percentage, on a very large extent, at least failed. I should say that. Okay. So let me get back to Joanne. I know the iron sheets issue has come up from <laughs> nearly everybody on the on, on the panel. And you see, what what is quite disappointing sometimes is the, the people themselves are joking about it. I saw the uh, Honorable Matia Kasaija appearing and he said, me, I found the iron sheets at my home, you know, in my, <laughs> in my compound. I didn't ask, <laughs> I didn't ask for the iron sheets. Yeah. I found them. Then there was that minister who said, uh, you know, I, I built, I had to roof, mm -hmm. use it to roof, for, for roofing for my animals because I needed to inspire. Yeah. I mean, the people of Karamoja don't have shelter. Anyway, 
putting that issue aside, leaving it back to Joan. Yeah. So Joan, to to finish up and wrap up the issue of accountability in terms of corruption, yeah. my question is what hasn't the government put in place, you know, mm -hmm. that you feel should be put in place mm -hmm. in order to fully cap the issue of corruption? Um, well, thank you, Nigerita. So basically, what I feel like the government has not put in place, I would still go back to the issue of the right people being in the right offices. I feel like most people become corrupt because, let me say, you know how basically Ugandans have been farmers and it is their way of life. It doesn't mean you cannot change. But if someone is corrupt and that has become their way of life, they feel they are scared if, if I'm not corrupt, what about, because most of them are threatened into corruption or they are afraid of losing their jobs because they are not doing what they are being told to do. I feel like if you put the right people in the right offices, having the right purpose, knowing why they are there, and knowing that as I am a Ugandan, we are Uganda. There are citizens out there that are paying these taxes to get these services. I feel like if you do that, the corruption level will be reduced. Because when, when you say the right people, what yes. do you mean? I mean the right qualifications, not a family reunion like <laughs> Mark <laughs> said. I mean the right qualifications. If I have studied, it comes out from... I have studied, I have the documents, I am right for the job, but you are not giving me the job because I am not connected to you in any way. I am not your tribe, I am not your relative. Like, I feel like that should be done away with. I feel like you should start employing people because of what they can bring to the table. Okay. See, if we start from there, and if I have studied with a passion to do something, if I am given the opportunity, I believe I can do it. So if you put the right people in the right place. I think that can reduce on the corruption. Then uh, secondly, I would also suggest that as Uganda, as Ugandans, it all comes back to us. It all comes back to us as Ugandans. Because the people out there, the people that are suffering, the people in Karamoja, the people <clears throat> that the iron sheets were stolen from obviously are still suffering. Um, it all comes back to us as Ugandans. We should have a heart that gives. We should be more, more giving. What I mean to say is more selfless. Like, if I am somewhere, I should understand that the, the people I am helping actually do need the help. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say, but basically I feel like if we resort to having better characters as people in power, then basically... I don't think there is a need to be corrupt if you know that who you're helping actually needs the help and you have enough. Like basically all these people that are being corrupt have enough money. I mean, their salary is enough to sustain them. Like basically them, their families, it, it is enough. Like we should all live within our means and stop racing, like stealing actually, that is stealing. We should stop stealing from the poor. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne, for that. Let me move to Derek. So, Derek, let's look at accountability from a different angle as well. Earlier on, we widened the scope, and uh, Davis also came and further widened the scope of accountability. So let's look at the issue of human rights. Human rights, this has also come up a lot lately. We saw someone's chest being ironed, and then at some point... Uh, recently, the twist of events even changed, which became more, you know, we, it seems we have issues of human rights is something that we cannot move away with. So my question to you is, what is your perspective on accountability in the aspect of human rights in this country? Well, thank you so much, our moderator. Uh, in my view, or according to my view, uh, Human rights in Uganda, really there is a lot of violation of human rights in Uganda and it is due to the poor accountability, okay? The root cause, it's all about accountability because if you don't account for people's lives, that means you're not accounting for 
be your country, okay? Uh, but the game, I don't know, cause for me, I call it drama, okay? Someone comes out with a different statement at the start and then comes out with another statement. That means I, that, that came to my mind that maybe that person is bribed a bit to come back and say different statement because I heard that man telling us that to, that it was just a game that was played between the North MPs so that they may bring some kind of image just to blackmail the government that is violating what? Their rights. Yeah, which makes we the citizens ah, confused. Yes, which makes us <laughs> Literally, so much. that a person mm. can iron their <coughs> chest. Their chest, just because they promised you 50 million, you put your chest and they hang you, you you get those scars that will even not you disappear. Even, you first even disappear for a long time. So it's, it's anyway. Yes, that means that uh, when that that brings for me a poor view of our leaders because if you can bribe someone, maybe that is all that all brings us to accountability because where did where did he expect that fifty million to come from? From the knock offices, from the knock bosses. Oh, how can we really get con how can we really get convinced that this man was not really told what to speak, yet he was in Imbuya? Okay, it would come to media center here. It tells us that why why were you in Mbuya to tell us all that? Okay, then when maybe that is my aspect when it comes to human rights versus accounta accountability. Our money is being misused. It has to bribe people to bring us a, an image which is not right. Okay, to to blackmail the government as well as to to make the opposition so sweet so well. Okay, but uh, that is it. Me. Okay, let me bring Davis into the discussion because human rights is wide. Sure. Let us include the aspect of civ uh, clamp down on civil society organization, violence during election, everything that is human rights. How accountable is government in that, that aspect? Uh, thank you. Thank you, moderator. I think if we are to discuss the issue of uh, human rights, we should uh, uh, strongly, vehemently uh, agree that first of all the constitution which is the supreme law uh, emphasizes that human rights are inherent and not given or granted by state that means uh, the aspect of human rights is not supposed to be dictated by the state to decide on who should have the rights or not uh, because if you to look at uh, rights under chapter 4 rights that have for instance, for decades been, viol uh, been violated, are rights that are worth to be kept safe. Uh, still, Article 44 of the Constitution of our Supreme Law, because I ever want to emphasize on the Supreme Law, because it derives, it has all those rights and how they're supposed to be implemented under the Constitution. Uh, Article 44 provides for a number of rights that are, are not derogable, not subject to derogation meaning these are supposed to be absolute rights, like a right to a fair hearing, a right uh, uh, protection on uh, cruelty, human and degrading treatment. But these rights have been violated. When you look at the right of a fair hearing, it embodies a number of aspects. When someone is to be brought to court, how he's supposed to be taken in court, his access to the lawyer, how he should be brought to court, uh, uh, how this person is supposed to be brought to court uh, and not supposed to be kept under custody uh, or custody or under any safety, uh, any, uh, any safety protection or any safety se uh, sect for more, if say, if it is police for more than the constitution itself uh, provides that uh, a person is not supposed to maybe say uh, being uh, under police before he's brought to court for more than 48 hours meaning those are roughly two days more than for more than two days but when you look at the practical part of it that is totally impossible because we've been having people who are in police custody for even more than months more than years and they're never brought to court you even wonder where the law is practical in nature because i believe that when someone is accused of a crime then he, this crime should be stipulated under the laws they should follow the right procedures 
so that this person can have justice because I believe justice is supposed to be not to be limited to a certain sect of persons. Justice is supposed to be for everyone because when you look at uh, how people have been tortured, we've uh, been having a lot of abductions coming out and there is no accountability for them. People disappear and they are never brought back. People are crying out there in the villages and their, people, their sons, their daughters are never brought back. Under uh, these abductions, the government has not really done anything to, to really uh, solve such a, solu uh, uh, such, uh, such a problem. In that these are supposed to be. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question. Uh, what brings all that? Are courts of law independent or not independent? Uh, I, 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 I always get disappointed when, uh, when people say that our courts of law are independent. Because it may be the root cause of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, which is true. Because uh, from the face of it on the, cons the Constitution, the Constitution also emphasizes that these are supposed to be independent. When you look at uh, uh, the issue of separation of powers, that uh, we have... Even the establishment of the courts themselves. True. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, these courts are in existence, but they are influenced by a number of persons, say maybe by these people who are in power, because... I, I yeah. David, as you wrap up, we are running out of time. Okay, yeah, yeah so to wrap up, uh, I think uh, conclusively, I should say uh, that the issue, the aspect of human rights and uh, how to promote them should be everyone's responsibility that we do not hinge it on, say, government and say it is government to only emphasize promotion of these rights. It starts with us as uh, Ugandans, that whoever you see violating a right to report, because if we keep quiet and see these people tortured and see these, people, uh, these people's rights get violated and we keep quiet, then we get accountable as human beings as well. So I should say, that the issue of accountability and the promotion of these protection and promotion of these human rights should be everyone's responsibility. Okay, thank you so much, Davis. So I know um, Mark had something to say, but we are running out of time. <laughs> Let me now pose the question on the solutions. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with you, Mark. What do we need to do as a country to ensure full accountability? Um, as you can country, start by the point that you wanted to push. Okay. The, the, the point yeah. I wanted to push was that our courts are independent. Really? Uh, yes. Okay. And I want to support my point. Do you know why? Mm. The problem is the people we have in the courts. Mm. Okay. Because recently uh, we have a good example of a judge who out of the way she wants the truth, but right now she's being put under pressure. She yes, has been suspended. Yes, exactly. Yes. Her salary is on suspend. Now the other rest of the colleagues want her off of cases. So, Mark, does, does that show independence? Because we saw that has been a fight between the judge and the yeah, chief the, justice. Yes, yes. Yeah, that shows there is some, and then, some hope And then the judges are appointed by the president who belongs to the executive. Mm. Yeah. Yes, he appoints them, but that doesn't mean he has appointed their willingness to judge. I mean, okay, I don't want no. to report <laughs> no, I don't want to report and back, <laughs> yes. but, but let me just ask you this. Mm. The president appoints, uh, let, me, let me, two things. One, the president appoints the judges. Yes. It belongs to the executive. Now, my question to you to think about is, do you think that he will appoint somebody who will not speak to his, to, to, to his demands? And let alone the issue of promotion from court of appeal to qualify to go to Supreme Court, the chief justice, deputy chief justice. Then two, the, the, my question is on the quality of the judgments that have come out of court. I mean, the election um, was not free and fair. However, the substantiality, <laughs> it's not substantial. Mm. You know, the substantiality test so we cannot nullify the election. So the quality of the judgment, do you think it, there is some sort of interference with the independence of the judiciary? Yes, of course there is. You, you do understand. As you said, because the president appoints you through 
making consultations, that is number one. He has to look through, they have to look through a paper and say that, okay, is someone capable? And I do accept that we do have independence in courts, but the biggest problem and the challenges we are facing are the people, the willingness. Yes, the president has appointed you as a judge, but does not mean he has appointed your willingness to judge. Characters. Mm, yeah. You to judge the people. That is why you're seeing that sometimes judges who, are against, who go against other judges are always put into a quality. Definitely. As you can see, also ministers, those who, are against, who go mm -hmm. against anything, there is done what? That shows that we do have some hope of independence within courts, mm -hmm. and we can at least say that, yes, we, we can go somewhere. But the biggest problem is always the people. Because I always say, for a system to work, you need to change the people. Okay. That you cannot change the system for the people to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the solution. Now we go to the solution of accountability from human rights to everything. Uh, number one, Human rights, I want to start with human rights. You know, some be within our era since independence, are specifically the one said that I can guarantee you freedom of speech, but I cannot guarantee you freedom after speech. Initially, what does that mean? Be careful of what you say. Mm -hmm. But also, as we know in law, I do have the right to freedom of speech, but I do have a duty to what I say. Mm -hmm. So as we citizens also, we need to be mindful of what we say. No matter yes, I might not like the government, I might not like the opposition, but I should be mindful of what I say. Should we? Yes, we always, we do have a duty. When yeah. we have freedom of speech, should of, we? Of course, yes. you, do have, you do have freedom of speech. <laughs> Nobody has said you don't have. When you're, not, when you're not breaking the law, let's say you're not committing defamation, mm. sort of. But most of the cases, you do have defamation, defamation that we Sorry, make as defamation. with our citizens. That is something I think we do not understand. You know, you know defamation is a, is a false statement. Exactly. That you don't, a, a false statement that you make. And there should be malice behind it. Yes. So in a situation where somebody comes up and is speaking, because defamation is so able. So do you think we should still be careful? About yes, we should always. You do have your freedom to speak. Nobody has said you don't have it. You have it. It's not absolute. Do we have this? My question you, to you, you yes. my question to, be, to you, Mark, yes. is do we have freedom of speech when Sorry. you're telling okay. us we need to be careful with what I'm you not say. saying you need to be careful. I said you have your freedom of speech, but you should be mindful of what, what you, say you say because it will hurt the other. For example, as they had suggested that someone said, the, the government tortured me then in switch of events. We are seeing the other side mm -hmm. saying the opposition. Mm -hmm. So who am I going to trust on both One. of the two? No. And I'm, me, me specifically, I'm not going to trust any of you because I don't know the truth yet. Okay. I don't know if it's the opposition who is the truth worthy or it's the government. <laughs> so until we find out the duty yeah. of the other individual. We, until we find out who they, I am the chest. Who I am by chest, I yeah. am not trusting any of you. Okay. Because in most cases, even we, I, we, we don't trust oppositions because why? The opposition's do fake up many things. Definitely. They do put up propaganda mm -hmm. to tarnish the government. Mm -hmm. that is and sometimes the government is also evil in one way or the other. So before I make my judgment, we need at least clear evidence. Because now, yes. now, as you can see, the man is from this side. Because we don't know what is really happening. Maybe but the, the chest 10 is iron. But yeah, the yeah. chest is iron, the <laughs> money is promised. I so. think you still remember the, the saga around the NUP party. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. How, how it was bought. Uh, you know, and, mm. and, and, and so forth, you, that, that whole saga, it's not no, it, 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 it literally says one thing and two yeah. things. So it literally shows out. also that our position in some unity. You know, they are still also divided. It's organized. You know? Okay. So now we go back to solutions. Um, solutions as individuals for human rights, we, need, we do need, because for human rights, naturally, it has to be the courts of law. We need to apply for so much. Because this, this is our next of kin where we can fight for our courts of law. Uh, sorry, for our human rights. And also the army, the police, and uh, the other organs, the security organs, they should know that in case someone is a suspect, that person is not supposed to be arrested according to law, from what I understand from law. If you're a suspect, you're supposed to be given maybe some limitations, don't get out of a country, don't do ABC, or don't move outside a specific region. But you're not, you're not supposed to arrest me put me into detention for more than 24 hours, and yet I've not called anyone for help. Now you have violated my right there. And then if we come to corruption, let us, let the other responsible people arrest those who are in charge. It's not because someone is a minister, someone is an MP, because someone is a son of someone. We don't really want to know that. Mm. You have embezzled our funds as taxpayers. You need to be arrested. 
And if it's found out that you're guilty, you refund it. Refund our money. If you cannot refund our money, mm. let the government take a pro because I know if you cannot refund money and you use that money maybe to buy whatever you had, mm. things that you bought are supposed to be sold off and the exact money is supposed to be returned. Mm. Meaning that assets. now we have been what? Repopulated. Now we have received what we are supposed to be receiving. Let them not just arrest, say that, okay, this person has been sentenced to jail for two years. As me a taxpayer, I'm not saying the real sense is that you're going to go and sit in jail for two years and then you come back out because you already made investment After with eating out yeah, beans, 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 beans. You have enjoyed our iron sheets, they're covering your houses. <laughs> you come back, you enjoy your luxury somewhere there. No, they are supposed to arrest you, take those things, sell them out because you know banks do that. Mm. Yeah, if you take a loan from a bank, you build a house to come, mm. sell off your house, take the exact money at once and its interest and give you back the rest. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Mark. Let's let's move to Joan. So Joan, what are some of your solutions? Um, um thank you. So I'll start with the issue of human rights. Yeah. Uh for a solution to human rights, I still feel like it shouldn't just be left up to the government. I feel like Ugandans need more patriotism and unity because I've, I've been, I don't know if I'm the only one here, but you've been seeing these videos going around where a person is recording a snap or is tweeting or doing a TikTok and someone is being brutally beaten in the background. And they'd be like, hey, Bamukubia, like they are totally not concerned. You have lost a sense of humor. That's why yeah. we are putting more of passion before principles. Yes, like they, there is no humanity among Ugandans anymore. Mm. I mean, basically, you would be able to help. You're seeing a child is being beaten by a housemaid. You're not helping, you're just recording a video and the Imagine. child is being beaten. Mm. And you want the government to do what? Yet it starts with you. You cannot help you and the government to do what? To come and watch over your house. No. We, we should all have humanity as humans, as Ugandans. Be more patriotic towards each other. Like, you see someone is being affected. Call the police. Help them. Do not make a video and get more followers. I still feel like that should be one of our best solutions to human rights. Before we go to the government, to any officials, it has to start with us as Ugandans. Then moving on to the issue of corruption, um, I still stand by what I said. Um, we can lead by example. I still feel like you, if you get the right people within the right offices, we will not have a corrupt nation. How I, how I wish you get a chance. Yes. <laughs> you will not have. I always tell us such prices in the end. Amen. No, I but anyway. Correct. Yeah. We have hope. Lead by virtue. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because Joanne has emphasized that point well, from the beginning. How I wish she gets a chance. She has been consistent. Mm. So, Joanne, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Let me shift to, to Derek. Your solutions. Yeah, my solutions, they will not be far different from, from those of my colleagues. But maybe I see, uh, according to human rights, the solution to violation of human rights must be, it is one one-on-one -on -one responsibility, okay? It must be your own responsibility to protect your rights and to be in the right place, in the right time and in the right, in the right word. There are three things. Mm -hmm. Right place, right time. Right time. <laughs> In the right time, right, right place, place, with the right people. Mm. Okay? True. Yes. If you are with the wrong people, if you move with the criminals, that means you'll be taken as what? A criminal. Okay? Yeah, however much for me, I don't support some human rights. I don't grant them. Like those rights that are being pushed to us by the Westerners, the, the, the drama that I'm, the, yes, the drama that I'm seeing on mm. social media running around. For me, I disagree with that. Therefore, I will not grant that to anyone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then the other thing is, uh, according to corruption, it is that we should change our mindset. We should change our mindset as Ugandans. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you one thing, our dear viewers: if you don't change your mindset, if you don't change the way you see things, the government will do nothing to you. Mm -hmm. If you don't help yourself, you will not get out of that bondage you're in. Mm -hmm. Okay. It because everything starts with you. If you want to change anything in your life, it starts with you. Then if you want to change our country as Ugandans to be corruption free, it should start with me, I, this one and the other one, plus the officials that are in the what? In the offices that are fighting corruption. Because actually it is my advice to the people in power to actually to the president of Uganda, let him select people of character. People that value purpose, okay? 
because we are seeing people that just eat, they are just eating our money but doing a lot of nothing. They are just dozing. Okay. Therefore, we should urge you to the president to appoint people that uh, really have that heart of the country, that, that heart of patriotism, that they love the what? Their country. Then the other thing is that nepotism should stop. Okay. If you want to end corruption in the country, let us let us use the thing nowadays they call it technical no you let us stop that let us use the technical no how if you qualify being that office and if you get a chance let let you do what is let i want you to do what is really meant actually i want that person to do what is really meant for her to do in the what in the office not to do the other way and then the other way then the other thing is that maybe it's according to salaries i don't know if people are getting low salaries but uh, the salaries must be increased, maybe, so that these people may yeah, stop there corruption. There is a huge gap yeah. between the poor and the, the that income, is income distribution. Inequality. Okay. There is a high income distribution yes. you gap. find one person holding money of 3 million Ugandans. Someone mm -hmm. is earning 6,800 per second. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like the CEO yeah. of yeah, the yeah, airlines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 6,000 so. <laughs> per second. Anyway, those are some of the solutions. If we abide with that, but it but the actual thing is we Ugandans, we should change our mindset, we should change the way we do things, therefore our country will be corruption free. And we should stop that act of being so greedy, okay? You have a lot, but you're yearning for more. Hmm? You're having a lot, you go even to keep. That's why even we are suffering from land conflicts every day and every day. Someone is holding square miles of land, but it still needs that plot of the neighbor, which is what? In okay. his, yes. Therefore, maybe those are some of the practical solutions that must be done. Thank you. Derek, let me move to Davis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, for solutions, like I earlier said, I should first agree with uh, Mark on the point that he, uh, he had uh, when he said that some of these rights are not absolute, and that's right. Like when he emphasizes mm -hmm. that when you're speaking, you should know what you're speaking. Mm -hmm. I should say that yes, we have the rights, but some of these rights are not absolute and the others absolute, absolute rights. Yeah, they have limitations, right? So, but for the rights that are really absolute, like a right to fair hearing, freedom, for, uh, protection from human and degrading treatment, yes. these rights should be implemented because it wouldn't really look fair to have someone tortured, beaten down like the other days, we had uh, people who were totally, totally bombed. We had the palace bombed in Kasesa, and very many people lost their lives, especially the young, young, innocent persons who really didn't even have any attachment to what the government was saying, uh, was giving the rationale or the reason for having bomb, for bombing the palace. Actually, to interrupt you just a bit, even the person who was in charge of bombing that Paris was just given a promotion in the parliament to represent the army in the parliament. So, you see, so in that, this is really a challenge that if we have uh, the government and officials who vehemently and uh, for, uh, for all of a sudden keep putting uh, the, their rights or putting, putting their suggestions or what they think is right into their own consideration and forget the citizens that they are presenting, then we'll lose it out. I believe that if we to have leaders, then these leaders are supposed to be right representatives of these people who put them into power. Yeah, so the issue of human rights is really a broad aspect that it gets back to us all that uh, to believe and so conquer with the rest of our presenters today. That indeed the issue of human rights should be everyone's responsibility. That when you look at the right that is being violated, where someone is beaten up, where someone is maybe raped, come be the voice of this innocent person. Come be the voice of this person who is crying out there. We have people who are really crying out there and they do not, their cries are never addressed. So we have people who are really suffering, but they're keeping quiet because the moment they talk, they're going to be suffocated. So the issue is in that we should get back to our virtues, get back to our Christian virtues, our godly virtues, our humane virtues, and know that the protection of human rights and promotion of these human rights should be our responsibilities, responsibility of the citizen 
who may not be having the right to get to parliament to talk, responsibility of that member of parliament who is in parliament to talk for these people who cannot talk, responsibility of every leader, teachers, uh, mentors, motivation, uh, people, people, speakers, the young, old, the youths, and everyone so that we can have these rights get implemented because everyone would want to live in a country that is free, a country that is secure, a country that is worth to talk about in the rest of the countries, to be proud of, a country to be proud of. Yeah. Then the aspect of corruption, the aspect of corruption, I think, like uh, Madame said, yeah, indeed, people should be chosen on merit, mm -hmm. that uh, you get into office on merit, not on the family lineage, because if we have like lawyers, we young you are coming up, aspiring advocates, then we should be the right people to get there. Because we're really ready for, and we know the virtues, we know what we have to present for our people. Rather than having members, having officials getting, getting into power, getting into these administrative offices, just because of the family lineage. <clears throat> so these solutions should be implemented and it should be a, a wholesome issue of every citizen, every leader, every person in power and not in power to promote and protect our rights and fight against corruption. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Davis. We have come to the end of our talk show for today. I would like to say thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you, Scott, Mark, Joanne, Derek, and uh, Davis for gracing our invitation and being on this panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So thank you so much to our viewers for watching the show. Thank you to Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV for organizing an inter-university de debate, which is a platform where university students like the panel that we have had today get to debate some of these very important issues. As we know, the young people, uh, are, they form the biggest percentage in this country, and it's important that their voices are projected out there and Civic Space TV and Center for Constitutional Governance makes it possible for us. So we will end today's discussion here. See you again next week, same time.